right. Our next presentation comes from Ann Backhouse, who's the Education and Training Manager at POSI. Ann, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And I will go ahead and start my screen share. Great. Ann's going to be presenting Community's Influential Role in STEM Success. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about this. And um, as Brian mentioned, I'm Ann Buckhouse. I'm the Education Training Manager at POSI. And joining me today is Kiowa. And I'll let Kiwa introduce herself shortly. So, inspiring. With today's session, I'm taking a bit of a different track. Um, I'm focusing on the human or the people who make HPC happen. Your role as an HPC expert, whether you realize it or not, is critical in inspiring the next generation of researchers and scientists and technologists. I'm starting this session today with a story, and that's Kiowa's story. Thank you for joining us today, Kiowa. And I know you've had a couple of rough days with uh, some power outages and the earthquake of what, 5.9 in Melbourne. So I'm glad that you're here. And uh, thank you for joining us. Over so I first met Kiwa. I have to say, I met Kiwa about two and a half years ago when I joined POSI. I met her in Melbourne when um, she was just starting out. And I remembered her story to this day when I um, started first thinking about HPC Inspire, which is a new, um, a new thing we're doing in STEM. And there'll be some other things that we'll be talking about that we're doing in STEM as well, but this is new and HPC Inspire um, reminded me of Kiowa. And I think you'll find out in a moment why that's so. Kiowa, can you give that a try? Uh, I work for the Monash Year Research Center here in Victoria, Melbourne, Australia. Um, I work on the high performance computing team and my main role is to interface between high performance computing and deep learning researchers, machine learning researchers. So how did I get here? Um, I actually grew up in a regional town, um, sort of two or three hours out of Melbourne. Uh, so I always love learning, but I particularly love learning about literature and history and art. So definitely wasn't the student playing uh, with Minecraft mods at home or playing with Raspberry Pis. Uh, I was at home painting artworks. Um, so through my high school education, I got to the end. And in year 12, I studied history, art, literature, and I did three math units. I decided I really liked math for some reason, even though I wasn't particularly good at it at the time. I moved out of home, out of regional Victoria, into the city, uh, where I was able to study a Bachelor of Arts and Science at Monash University with majors in philosophy and pure math. Still no computing. Uh, I actually put my hand up for a mentorship program. So I'm a proud Zsa Zsa Rung woman. Um, I'm an Aboriginal Australian. Uh, and they had some programs going where I could get access to a mentor um, just from any field. And I got paired up with someone called Chris Watkins. Now, Chris Watkins worked at the CSIRO, a national science agency in Australia. Um, and he worked on the scientific computing team. He was a bit of an expert in machine learning and AI by the time he finished up at CSIRO. Uh, and he really encouraged and pushed me to do things like learn how to program. So I signed up for one Python programming subject at university. Halfway through that semester, he said, oh, you should apply for this cadetship we have going for Indigenous students at the CSIRO. Um, it would be with the scientific computing team. You'd be using your Python skills. And I shook my head and I laughed. I said, no way. Uh, I'm doing a pure math major. I know nothing about computers. I can barely get my Python code to run. That's ridiculous. Uh, despite that, he continued to encourage me, and so I applied for the program. Uh, for some reason, they hired me. I worked there over the next three years, over summer and winter. Um, in particular, I got to do some really interesting stuff with homomorphic cryptography, uh, applying that to machine learning problems, and then running jobs on the HPC. Uh, Chris continued to push me every single day, and he even pushed me to go present this work at conferences, which is where I was able to meet people like Anne, for example and some of the colleagues I get to work with now. Uh, I currently, as I said, now work at the Monash Air Research Center on the high performance computing team. And now I'm knee deep in Ansible playbooks and GPUs and cutting up A100s with new MIG technology. So I've come a very, very long way um, from my regional town and my art. 
On the next slide, you'll get to see a comic I drew before Chris Watkins left the CSIRO. Um, he championed and pushed me through my career uh, and without leaders like him and leaders like the people who are at this conference, I definitely would not be in HPC today. Um, but I think it's exciting and important to have diverse and interesting people with different backgrounds in high performance computing because we support diverse and interesting researchers and people. So that's a little bit about me. I think Anne's got some other exciting stories to share. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and so we've heard one story. What about you? You're here today because you're leaders in your field. Leaders rarely become leaders without a passion for what they do. Such a passion that, um, that you are just talking about. Uh, so my question to you is, what propels you forward in your work every day? What inspires you as a leader, as a person? Does a person inspire you? Does the science inspire you? Does your technology inspire you? Take a minute to think about what inspires you and jot a few words down. I can't see the chat, but feel free to um, jot those words down about what inspires you in the chat. And we'll be coming back to that a bit later. So like people, the Australian government has its own story. It's identified science as critical for the country to deliver new sources of growth to maintain high wage jobs and to seize the next wave of economic prosperity. The remit is clear. STEM, and personally I prefer to be called STEAM, but STEM needs to be part of our DNA. And I would suggest the world's DNA. If we're going to take on the world's largest challenges, such as pandemics, climate change, food sustainability, et cetera. Ozzy takes an active role in STEM, and this slide highlights some of our activities from 2016 through 2020. The demand for skilled data scientists and data literate researchers is growing. Each quarter, we receive an increasing number of requests for incursions, excursions, guest lectures, res -bas appearances, etc on data, computing, HPC, containerization, how to teach online, and more. The WA state government, as well as the Australian federal government, are embedding more digital technologies outcomes into the school curricula. As an educator, this embedding of STEM into the school curricula makes my heart sing. It also makes good business sense. The jobs of the future, many of which don't exist yet, incorporate not only STEM-based skills, but also STEM-based ways of looking and thinking about a problem. So Posi recently soft launched a new portal called Learn at Posi. It's still in its infancy. The site contains mostly information to promote data science, but we've got brand new plans. Um, and some great ideas that um, how the site will expand. From this site, teachers and students can generate their own data using a unique identifier for their class. And that is all anonymized. They use that identifier to complete a sleep survey. They can build their own databases and visualizations from their data set and or they can compare their data to the larger data set. They also learn about data hygiene, data outliers, et cetera. They can view graphs or they can create their own graphs. They learn how to tell a story through visualization as well. Teachers have access to a set of materials and activities that are aligned to state and federal curricula in science, math, and digital technology. Already with just a soft launch, we've received queries from the State Department of Education regarding the possible use of this tool as professional learning for the state's 33,000 um, public teachers. 
In a couple of weeks time, this site will be used in a five week integrated studies program for over 250 students in one of Perth's public schools. The scientists themselves will be at this conduct and from there we'll create recorded videos that can be viewed repeatedly. On the horizon is a second data set around space and satellite imagery. So the internships are another POSI STEM activity that's gaining popularity. This year, like last, we'll be running this national program remotely. We provide a week of intense training upfront, which we offer to not only POSI interns, but also other interns in the Perth area. And that doubles and triples our training cohort. We're able to do this through a program of intern mentorship. So previous interns return as mentors to new interns. Those mentors continue to build on their technical skills, but also build new skills in community building, team building, creative problem solving, and project management. The mentors co-lead this 10-week program, which culminates in a virtual poster and presentation session. This is an incredibly rewarding program. Some interns produce research outcomes that contribute to a larger in institutional project. Some interns produce publications. Some interns produce what I call springboard outcomes. Um, one of those would be the sleep survey that I just talked about which was springboarded or kicked off uh, from one of last year's uh, internship programs. And some interns have completely switched career tracks based on their experience. And this brings us back full circle to inspiration, a key repeating theme in feedback that we receive from interns um, is that of the project supervisors and the impact and inspiration that the students and interns have gotten about their choices, about what they wanna do with their career. So another new site that's sparking conversation is called BRACEOP, or the Digital Skills Australia. This is a new portal developed by co-investment from POSI and ARDC with support from critical support from 10 additional universities and institutions nationally. It's based on European, Europe's Elixir test platform, which is targeted at the life sciences. Ours, DRESA, is targeted more broadly. It's a training registry and calendar that supports digital research skills. It's a one-stop shop for researchers, scientists, and STEM students looking for training sessions and events, materials, and more. This means students don't have to go from site to site or from one institution to the next looking for what training materials are available. Rather, they can go to one place. With DRESA, we're trying to address the F the fair, in FAIR digital skills training, namely the findability. Now, from a trainer's perspective, this project has ranked in the top three priorities for the last three years and potentially longer, according to the ARDC Skills Summit. As a trainer, I can identify what training is offered nationally, and that eliminates duplication, that eliminates duplication of effort. I can also identify gaps in topics. Finally, I can identify individuals and institutions working in the same space as POSI, and I can reach out to them to collaborate on building or conducting training. So the STEM pipeline, uh, this is not a new concept, nor is the idea of the importance of teaching STEM from primary to secondary to tertiary and beyond. However, what's disconcerting and what we need to address is the pipeline leakage. And this was covered in the Women in STEM Decadal Plan. And unfortunately, the pipeline isn't as straight as it looked in the, previous, in the previous slide. It branches off and individuals fall out of the pipeline or leave, choose to leave the pipeline for very many reasons, as you can see here. Again, 
a leaking pipeline is not news. However, of particular importance is understanding how it's leaking and where it's leaking along the way. From poor mentoring models to disengagement to um, bias and discrimination, um, career interruptions, et cetera, it's important to understand these if we're going to look at how to fix the, the leaking pipeline. So we are very motivated to contribute. Uh, we work across the pipeline. I have to admit that I have selfish reasons for my enthusiastic promotion of STEM, um, especially in secondary and tertiary. And that reason is to make my day job easier. So my day job is the upskilling and enablement of POSI users. With a solid foundation in STEM, new POSI researchers can get on and use our infrastructure faster and with less disruption to their research. This means we aren't teaching foundational skills. Instead, we can spend our time and our effort on teaching advanced skills in optimization, parallelization, containerization, et cetera. Without STEM as a norm or part of the curricula in primary, secondary, and tertiary, we spend a lot of our time teaching foundational skills. And that means that science and research slows down. So I'm leaving with a call for action. I believe that we haven't reached the end of this particular story. We're all called upon to stop the leaking pipeline and to lift our local, our national, and our global levels of knowledge and skills in STEM. Indicators, such as the Future of Work report recently re released in Western Australia, following a year's worth of research on changes to work, the workplace and the workforce, point to a tenuous situation on a knife edge, really, to proactively and quickly upskill in STEM or be left behind. I think is what we've heard today from Addison and Glad that about you know, cluster competitions and things that we've been talking about here, I think we're stepping up to the challenge. But we have the opportunity, I feel strongly, that we can inspire the next generation. And this doesn't have to be big. It can be big, but it doesn't have to be big. It can be through a guest lecture. It can be through a recording. It can be through a conversation with a PhD candidate or an early career researcher or a STEM student. I can't emphasize enough the influence that you do have, whether you know it, whether it's formal, whether you don't know it or it's informal, you inspire by simply sharing your passion, um, by simply doing what you do. So at this point, I'm closing with a request for you to contribute to HPC Inspire. You can see here, we've had two students already uh, contribute to this. It's a new and growing uh, repository of short videos on people or um, situations that have inspired individuals and, and Kyle as will be joining that, uh, that uh, repository. Um, we'd love to capture your short inspirational video or story. Um, we'd like to capture them from across the pipeline. So I hope you consider contributing. It'll only take about 10 minutes of your time. But regardless of whether you contribute or not, I hope you'll continue to have those conversations and share the passion that you have that inspires everyone around you. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Uh, what a great program. And uh, it's great uh, to have Keawa on as well to talk about uh, her uh, great time with the mentorship. And, and that brings me to just my question. Um, I mean, you had a great number of students there in the, what was that, the 2020 to 2021 um, year? And uh, about how many mentors are assigned to each one of these students? Is it kind of like a one-to-one -one or 
one to many. Yes, it's a one to many. So I'd love to have a one to one. Um, so to grow the program. So last year we doubled up to 25. This year we're doubling up to almost 50. Um, last year we tried the mentorship program for the first time and we had two intern mentors. Um, this year we're looking to have three intern mentors. Um, and we, um, one of the slides too, I said that uh, kind of our MO is to walk alongside programs. So we are walking alongside other programs as well in our mentorship program. And we also have, I guess you would call mentorship coming from those as well. Um, and that would include ICRAR and Data61. Um, so we've got quite a few that are unofficially mentors and um, more there are three this year that we'll have officially as mentors. Got it. Got it. A lot, mm, it is a, a lot, a lot I fewer we, than I thought. Yeah. Funding, if we had funding, I'd have a lot more mentors. I can tell you that. So understand. And the program would be bigger. Is that mostly volunteer then? No, no, they're paid. The internships oh, it's, it's paid are paid. Mentorship. Okay. Yes. Got it. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is paid. Their uh, internships are paid. It's 10 week paid and the mentors are paid as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thank you.